and welcome to Ipsy Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Daron Dorfman, Associate Professor of Law at Syracuse University School of Law. We will discuss his article, Unusual Suspects, Deservingness, Scarcity, and Disability Rights, which will be published in the UC Irving Law Review, as well as his work on disability studies, health law, and the law of, uh, and law and psychology more, more generally. So, Daron, D- welcome, welcome to the show. Hi, Brian. Thank you for having me. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. So, I, 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 as I was saying earlier, I really enjoyed um, this paper we're going to be we're going to be talking about. But before we launch into the paper specifically, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of how you're combining these fields of law, sort of what your kind of your your kind of research project is like, and kind of contextualize a little bit the paper we're going to be talking about within the broader scope of the work that you do. Uh, yeah, for sure. So I'm a disability law and a health law scholar, and I'm interested in broad questions of trust and legitimacy in legal institutions. And in questions like what makes people stand behind certain laws and policies and what makes them push back against others. And I think those questions are very valid and very important in the area we're living in today, but they're also very important when researching disability law. Because if you think about it, disability law is made in everyday situations by everyday actors who are interpreting what the law really means and how to enforce it. And we can think about many instances when we enforce disability law in our everyday life, um, from approving learning accommodations to a student in our class, to um, a clerk allowing a service dog to enter their uh, store, um, to, you know, compelling someone not to park in a disabled parking spot. And my work really goes into those ideas about trust in the everyday life of law, both in disability law and in health law. Um, And this specific paper is part of a larger project on what I call fear of the disability con. So we know that the the last three decades were revolutionary in terms of recognition of the rights of people with disabilities in the United States and around the world. Um, But what I talk about in my project, which was my doctoral dissertation, is the backlash against disability rights in the everyday. And this backlash comes into play with the moral panic about people taking advantage of disability rights and faking disabilities in order to get an unfair advantage. Anything from learning accommodation in college to uh, misrepresenting their service animals Oh, and their pets as service animals, I mean, to so social security fraud and anything in between. And that's um, what I wrote my dissertation on. And this specific paper is part of that larger project on the fear of the disability con. And two other uh, papers are currently under review and there's going to be another one um, coming up. In order to investigate those issues, I use empirical tools. So I'm an empiricist and I um, do work in law and psychology. So I usually um, conduct a survey experiments or surveys. And I also conduct interviews um, with people with disabilities. So I use mixed methods, quantitative and qualitative methods. Okay. Okay. Well, so by way of kind of situating this work for listeners who may not be familiar with disability studies or or health law. Maybe you could just like really briefly provide some context about the sort of, as I understand it, the sort of the core federal law providing for kind of a disability rights regime, which is the Americans with uh, Disabilities Act. So where did that come from? When was it enacted? And sort of what was it intended to do? Well, that's a very good question. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, was enacted in 1990. It's a really interesting piece of legislation because it is bipartisan and it was enacted um, in the government um, by um, George um, H.W. Bush, the George Bush Sr., um, who actually um, had some kind of a personal relationship with disabilities because of... um, um, people in his life, and other other people in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party who came together to establish this omnibus um, anti-discrimination law. Now, the ADA is an anti-discrimination law that covers 
um, many areas of uh, law. Um, specifically, it covers um, in Title I, employment. In Title II, it covers governmental institutions. And in Title, in title III, it covers um, private institutions. Um, it's a really, when I say it's an omnibus anti discrimination law, I mean that it's the first law that really encompasses rights for people with disabilities and see them as a minority group, a, a minority group that was discriminated against uh, for many, many years. Um, and it created a lot of change with regard to uh, the lives of people with disabilities from accessibility of um, stores, like under Title III, for example, even if they're privately owned, to uh, um, you know, getting them more uh, established in the workplace. And I'm also want, I also wanted to mention that before the ADA was enacted, there was Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, uh, which is a precursor to the ADA, and that actually is very similar to what we have in Title II that prohibits discrimination by um, organizations that get some federal funding. Um, what's also very interesting to mention about the ADA is that there was backlash against the ADA in the Supreme Court and in federal courts throughout the 1990s and early 2000s when the um, definition of disability was interpreted by courts very, very narrowly, especially in the employment context. So what uh, judges did is they did that they, they didn't recognize many of the plaintiffs um, as people with disabilities. They, those plaintiffs did not fit into the idea that judges had about who is a person with a disability, and that's why they prevented standing from those uh, for those plaintiffs. And a lot, many, many cases. Um, fell through. Um, we got the Sutton Trilogy, which is a, a, a series of cases. Um, that, and then we have Toyota, uh, which is another big case. Um, and what happened after that was the 20, um, 2008 amendment to the ADA. And what the 2008 amendment did is it inserted into the, into the ADA some kind of ideas about how to interpret it, how to interpret what disability really means, um, meaning that now courts had to interpret disability in a much broader way, and not um, and not prevent fi- uh, standing from future plaintiffs. And the um, ADA amendment actually worked, and we can see empirical research that has been done um, since then showing that um, nowadays the courts actually follow the construction uh, of what disability should be uh, following the um, 2008 amendment. So it it struck me reading your paper um, and sort of thinking about the broader context of the questions that you're asking is that there are sort of these uh, almost like conceptual or fundamental questions about what the ADA does. And so like on some level, there's, I think, a temptation that some people have to refer to it as creating something like a positive, right? But you also talk about what the ADA does as creating accommodations. I I wonder if you could talk about those two terms and why accommodations might be a more appropriate term to use for what the ADA is doing. Yeah, um, I think what's going on nowadays is that people see accommodations that are meant to level the playing field for people with disabilities, that people perceive them as special rights, right? And I think the reason, and when I say special rights, people might be uh, familiar with the use of the term with regard to other minorities, such as um, in the LGBTQ community, or we can talk about racial communities, we can talk about um, workers' unions as well. This is not a minority group, but the special rights discourse was also applied to them. And what people think about it is that those um, people use rights in order to get an unfair advantage. They use their identity to get an unfair advantage. Um, They're not using it to level the playing field. They're actually getting something more that us as a majority really want as well. And that's very, very clear with disability accommodations um, because 
I think everybody would like some more time on exams, right? Everybody would think that would be very helpful for us. Everybody would like to take their pet um, on the airplane with them um, or to the store or to the museum with them um, without paying an extra fee or just to be allowed to do that. And people would really want to park closer to the, um, I guess, to the entrance to uh, buildings or to get in front of lines in all kinds of situations, like in theme park, which I talk about in my paper. Um, and people don't, people really see disability accommodations as a, a, as special rights and not as something that is meant to help people with disabilities come to the same level as people who are not disabled. And I, and you mentioned the idea of positive rights versus negative rights. And I talk about it a little bit in the paper that because the American legal tradition is based on negative rights and not about positive rights and accommodations are, you know, within of themselves, they are positive rights because it's the, it's the state that gives something. They need to actually invest resources and hand something to the individual. So it is positive rights, but they're so foreign in the negative rights uh, legal environment that people see them as different. And maybe that's the reason that people actually view them as special rights that are prone to abuse. Because if people do see disability rights as uh, special rights, people might think that people are faking it in order to get them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the in the paper, you were getting at a particular kind of subset of concerns around that question. So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what question or questions you were asking or wanted to pose in this paper and what you chose to study in order to get at those questions and why you thought that those would be sort of a useful focus for the questions you were interested in asking. Yeah, so as I said in the beginning, this is part of a bigger project on the fear of the disability con, this you know moral panic that everybody around us are faking disabilities and getting an unfair advantage in order to enjoy the freaking disabilities, in order to enjoy disability rights. And in this paper, I use experimental design to look at what really influences people's suspicion about this abuse of law, about this disability con? What causes people to think that people are faking it in specific situations? And I was interested in two factors or two in, uh, independent variables um, that I thought might be affecting the level of suspicion. So the first one is the scarcity of resources in the situation, in the, in the, in the specific context. So, you know, we would think that when the um, resource is scarce in that, in that specific situation, like we're going to a parking lot, and we can't find a lot of parking. There's not many uh, uh, parking spots to be found that that would create the uh, assumptions that some people might fake disabilities in order to, pa to park in the disabled parking spot um, because they cannot find parking because, you know, there's very, very few uh, parking spots. So that's just scarcity of uh, resources issue. Um, another one of those that I also use is um, standing in line. So when you are standing in line, for example, when you go to a theme park like Disneyland, um, the scarce resources there is time because you do have a little, uh, you know, specific uh, uh, amount of time when you visit the park. And you would think that people would fake disabilities, right, um, in order to get to the front of the line um, when the uh, line is really, really long. And you probably will not think that people are faking it when um, the, sh the line is very, or the queue is very, very short. Um, so the first factor was the scarcity of resources. Um, now, the scarcity of resources does not always happen with regard to disability rights. For example, when uh, learning accommodations are there, uh, when we talk about learning accommodations, there's not really a scarce resource, especially if uh, the uh, grading is not done on a curve, right? When a, when one student gets more time on the exam or another special accommod or another accommodation, um, they do not take anything from the other person. So it doesn't always exist. But here in this paper, I look at situations where there is 
uh, an opportunity for scarcity of resources. So that's one uh, issue that I thought would probably influence people's suspicion about the abuse of disability rights. Um, the other one was um, the idea of deservingness, of how we see or how we think about the person with a disability or who is deserving to get disability accommodations. And it's really interesting because if you remember what I said a few minutes ago when I talked about the, the courts when deciding disability cases, deservingness played a really important role in those um, cases and in the doctrinal analysis of disability law um, because uh, judges did not see some plaintiffs as having disabilities, they did not really fit this idea about a person who's in a wheelchair, a person has a physical disability that is very uh, visible, that is very prominent. They actually thought, well, this person does not deserve to enjoy protection under the ADA, so we're just not going to give them standing. We make those kind of judgments about deservingness and who is a person who gets to get, uh, gets to have um, some protection under the ADA every day. And this idea about deservingness, about a person who seems the most deserving versus a person who might still be disabled but does not seem deserving in the eyes of others is the other factor that I looked at. That I looked at. Mm -hmm. And so the two factors that I looked at that um, in, might influence suspicion was the scarcity of resources in the situation and the level of deservingness of the person who asks or uses the accommodation. Okay, so your study specifically focused on on Disneyland, and it was quite a large study, actually. So I wonder if just briefly you could talk about sort of the size of the study and how you administered the study. Yeah, so this um, so this study is made out of two two by two experiments. Um, one takes place in a parking lot, and one takes place at a Disneyland line, like you mentioned. Um, there's actually uh, 3,000 people, um, that over 3,000 people actually, that took a part in this research, which was done online. It's survey experiments. So when I say it takes place in Disneyland or it takes place in a parking lot, it doesn't actually take place in a Disneyland or a parking lot. But rather, people see a vignette that takes place in those situations. But I just want to say these are situations that people probably experience in their everyday life. People experience standing in line. People experience... Um, um, a parking situation. And I used survey, exp uh, survey companies that I paid. Uh, I paid them um, um, money from grants that I received, um, and they give me representative samples of the U.S. population. Now, I ran those experiments um, a few times because I wanted to replicate, to see if they replicate, right? And I think the replication crisis that we know about in social science and psychology today, it was a very important thing for me to do. So I ran, basically I ran um, um, each of those experiments twice, um, and one time on their own. So um, one time on a sample that only got the parking experiment and another sample got um, the parking experiment. And then I ran it one more time when people got both of them and they were randomly assigned to people um, which would go first. You know, the order of them was randomly assigned as well. Um, yeah, and it's a two by two experiment because as I mentioned, there's two factors here. There's two indiv uh, independent variables. There's the scarcity of resource and that is the level of deservingness of the person um, who's asking for the accommodation. And each, each one of those factors has two uh, um, levels high or low. So high scarcity, low scarcity, high deservingness or low deservingness, and deservingness is measured through the visibility of the disability. Whether a person is a person's disability is visible or invisible, and we get a, a four situations if you think about it, right? So it's two by two, and each person gets is randomly assigned to one vignette with one of those four possible scenarios. Wow. Well, so with the replication there, did you did you find that the results replicated when you you know reran the study or when you ran it with both um, questions combined? Yeah, yeah. So um, actually, yes. So the results replicated across samples and across contexts. 
Um, I actually didn't mention that, but it is an experiment. I actually ran it three times because I am um, uh, I varied the uh, wait time that a person needs to wait in line um, for a Disneyland attraction, and um, I used three different uh, levels of um, waiting in line. So uh, one one set of wait times was two hours versus 10 minutes. The other one was one hour and versus three minutes. And the other one was waiting for five minutes or no wait at all. And in all of those, I got the same result. And I don't want to, I don't know if this is the time to uh, tell people what I found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so you came into the study with a hypothesis right. about how people would react to scarcity and the perceived deservingness. Um, did the study results line up with your hypotheses? And were there any like surprising things that you learned from the study? Yeah. So the, I think, you know, when I came to the study, I thought, you know, as I said in the beginning, or as I alluded to in the beginning, is that when the scarcity of resources is higher, when there's a scarce, when we're talking about a scarce resource, people will be much more suspicious than when we're talking about an abundance of resources, an abundance of um, uh, parking, sp uh, parking spots, or in a, a, a very short uh, a, a wait time. But, and I thought, you know, that that would be, that would reflect the results. And with the deservingness, I thought, yes, people will be uh, more trusting of a person with a visible disability who seems much more deserving than a person with an invisible disability. But what I found is that there was no statistically significant difference in the level of suspicion against abuse of disability rights, against abuse, against a disability con, right? There was no statistically significant difference in the level of suspicion when the scarcity of resources was high or low, meaning there was an abundance of a, a parking spots or a very few ones, or when you needed to wait in line for hours or minutes. Um, there was no statistically significant difference. People were, you know, basically suspicious, the, the same amount, um, there was only an, a, a statistically significant difference with regard to level of suspicion when we talked about, um, a per, about the deservingness of the person. So people were much more suspicious of a person with an invisible disabilities, people who seemed less deserving in their eyes, and they were much more trusting of a person with a visible disability um, Kind of like I expected. So, but I thought, you know, this is a really interesting situation. It really tells us something um, about um, the world. So it's the perceived deservingness of the beneficiary and not this pursuit of self-interest in circumstances of scarcity that drives suspicion about disability con, about this idea about abuse of disability rights. So people would be willing to circle the parking lot one more time or wait in line a little longer to accommodate people with disabilities as long as they know and they're sure that those people are actually people with disabilities who are deserving in their eyes and they're not fakers. Now we can take this and think about it in disability law but we can actually, it's helpful, you know, in understanding backlash against other uh, um, uh, distributive uh, rights or distributive law that use kind of like a queue-like mechanism when allocating goods or deciding eligibility for benefits or compensation. And we can think about um, health care and we can think about immigration or we can think about mass torts. And we can think about all of those fields of law where we have this idea about scarcity and deservingness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it struck me that like in, in your paper, you also tell a kind of brief historical account of how Disneyland's accommodation of people with disabilities has changed over time. And really, it sounds like changed for the worse in a lot of ways. And I wonder if you I wonder if you think that some of that change was influenced by or even driven by the kind of psychological phenomenon you you kind of identified in your study. Absolutely. So um, yes, you're right. So um, what happened with the Disneyland laws, I call them, with regard to or the disability policies in Disneyland, is that in the past. Disney Parks had a policy to issue some kind of a card for people with disabilities. It was called the Guest Assistant Card. 
and it allowed guests with disabilities and people in their parties to skip lines and enter attractions through alternative entrances. Um, but in October 2013, all hell bo- broke loose when reports about abuse of this disability policy started dominating um, the media and also public uh, uh, discourse. So there were two uh, specific issues. One of them was of uh, wealthy families who, are, who hired people with disabilities to act as their tour guides and, and take them on a tour, quote unquote, of Disneyland, and so they can all go to the front of the line. But there was also another issue about non-disabled people renting wheelchairs at the entrance to the park in order to go to the front of the line and pretend to be disabled. And actually, that was a bigger issue. Um, so as a consequence of that, um, what happened is that Disney changed their policies because, because of this fear of the disability con, because of this fear of abuse. And um, now what happened, um, what happened was that Disney had a new policy uh, with a new card called the Disability Access Service. And this card allowed guests with disabilities to get a, a ticket with a return time for every attraction in the park after visiting a special kiosk located next to it. So people with disabilities need to go across the park um, and get a return time to tell them when to come back to the attraction. And then they can you know, a, 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 a plan their visit to the park accordingly. But people with disabilities, after that happened in 2013, um, people were really upset. People with disabilities who were used to go to Disneyland and um, some of them hold annual passes. And interestingly enough, people with disabilities come from a lower socioeconomic background. And, you know, visiting Disney Park is not a cheap experience, but people with disabilities actually really liked it for years because it was a place where they felt they were accommodated properly, actually were really upset. And that's how we got a, a court case called AL versus Disney, Um, so the AL versus Disney case, it was filed in April, 2016 by an, a teenage autistic person who, um, to, to make a long story short, visited the park with the new accommodation, but actually had a meltdown who could, he could not, uh, longer visit the park and he had to leave after two hours of visiting the park. Um, and he uh, filed for an injunctive relief requiring Disney to return to their old guest policies um, or disabled or their old disability policy um, that, according to him, accommodates his needs better. Now, what's interesting about this case is that when it went to the U.S. Uh, District Court, the U.S. District Court actually ruled for Disney uh, because it actually um, uh, accepted their claims about the, this abuse of the disability policy, despite Disney never bringing any evidence as to how much abuse there really was in Disney parks, which is a really an astonish, astonishing uh, issue here. And it really talks about the main argument that I make in my line of scholarship about the fear of the disability con is that, you know, we have this moral panic that leads us to think about this social, consp- about this social problem that we don't know if that exists or not. Um, and, but what, you know, um, what happened later after I actually wrote most of this paper is that, um, um, there was an appeal to the 11th circuit that actually, um, turned it back, uh, turned back the, um, um, the spotlight to Disney and asked them to bring some more evidence to it and uh, reversed the uh, district court decision. So I talk about this doctrinal move and this specific really interesting case in this paper. And we can see, and what it really shows us is that this fear of disability con actually influences policies. It actually influences the law. It actually influences not only legis- legislators and policymaker, it actually affects the courts as well. And when people now encounter some kind of disability cases, in their dockets, or court or judges encounter those in those dockets, I urge them not to fall to the trap of you know and the moral panic about oh everybody's faking it or everybody's taking advantage of disability law. It's so easy to do that. 
you need to think about it a little further to look at the um, facts of the case and, you know, at the data that exists around um, how much abuse there really is. And I acknowledge that it's really hard to know how much abuse there really is, but there are ways to do it. And I do it in the paper as well. And not to, you know, fall into this trap and buy into this moral panic about the disability con because it's really dangerous. It really hurts people. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a kind of a version of a classic kind of type one, type two error problem compounded by the fact that, of course, many people either don't know or don't sort of realize in the moment that many forms of disability may not be immediately apparent to third parties. Right, right, exactly. And I think, you know, we're all indoctrinated to think about disability in a very specific way. You know, we all know the international symbol of access, right? That has this person in a wheelchair um, in white over a blue background that's called actually handicap blue. It's a, it's a very specific type of blue. Um, and we're all indoctrinated to think about those, about disability in a very, very specific and very, very narrow way that does not fit into what the people who uh, came out with the ADA thought about disability. And as I I said in the beginning of the conversation, the the ADA came to to see disability or people with disabilities as a large community, as a very, um, you know, cross-disability movement or cross-disability community that includes people with multiple, uh, very multiple impairments, a large array of impairments. Um, But, you know, people's ideas about disability do not fit with the legal idea of disability. And that causes this, you know, um, situation, this causes this kind of situations where people with disabilities do not get the accommodations they really need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so Daron, in in, in closing, I wonder if you could kind of talk more generally about this kind of hyper salience, as it were, of perceived deservingness when it comes to sort of public perceptions about the legitimacy of disability accommodations. Um, Sort of, what do you think we should do with that? And more importantly, I guess, in a lot of ways, sort of, where are you going next with this project? I'm assuming you're, as you say, you know, you're, this is one piece of a much bigger puzzle that you're, you're working on. Sort of, what do you see as the follow-up projects to this paper? Yeah, so thank you for asking that. So um, I have a paper that talks about disability con and the fear of the disability con more generally. And I, I claim, I, my claim in that paper is that the, the legal treatment of disability, uh, of disability in the U.S. was really influenced by this fear of the disability con, you know, dating back to the 19th century and even before that. Um, so that's one project. But the other one that I have is actually... Uh, about the use of assistance animals. Um, when I say assistance animals, I mean service dogs and emotional support animals. Ever since I started this project, which, as I said, was um, my doctoral dissertation five years ago, everybody wanted to talk to me about the dogs on the plane. So I finally um, did an experiment about that, and I have a paper coming up um, that is already written, and I'm going to submit it um, in this cycle Um, And hopefully it will get a good placement about uh, the use of um, assistance animals. So that's one paper. And then I have another paper that um, is also based on a survey experiment, which is really interesting. And it's um, this was my job talk paper for people who uh, are interested. And if I can give an advice to uh, people who are going on the market, be very careful about what you choose as your um, job talk paper. My next paper should never be your job talk paper because it's about learning accommodations in college. <laughs> and I guess I'm, I'm guessing most of the people who are hearing us, you know, have very specific uh, views about learning accommodations in law schools and in higher education. And what's interesting about this paper is that I ran um, my survey experiments before and after the college admission scandal. So I actually have data before and after that to show, yeah, to show how um, that influenced people's ideas. So stay tuned for that. That will take some time. And then I'm just going to say that in health law, in the health law arena, I also have um, a paper. Um, that also looks at trust 
um, um, but from a little bit of a different angle um, that also uses a, a survey experiment, and that's about um, the new medication um, PrEP that is um, aimed at preventing HIV. How does that correspond with the um, blood donation ban for gay men and with the recognition of gay families? So it's not really about abuse of law, but it's about trust there as well, and it also uses the same message. Awesome. Well, Darone, thanks you. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Um, I, I really thought this paper was was fascinating and um, you know a really interesting and I think important result as well. So I look forward to reading your your fu- your future papers in the same area. Thank you very very much, Brian. I appreciate your kind words and thank you for the great work you do with this podcast. <laughs> Right, but whatever they do, 